Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for braving the rain in your hunger for constitutional education and illumination. Uh, you've picked a great afternoon because we have a blockbuster group of two of the most thoughtful federal judges in the US debating one of the most important questions of criminal justice in our time, namely, is the sentencing system broken and why do innocent people plead guilty? Uh, this is an exciting time, as always, for the National Constitution Center, which is, as one or two of you have heard, the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And it is exciting in these polarized times that we are able to bring together the most thoughtful voices from all sides of the spectrum to debate not political issues but constitutional issues so that people can make up their own mind. We've got a phenomenal series coming up in the fall of our uh, role as America's Town Hall. The new season opens on September uh, 17th, Constitution Day, where Justice Stephen Breyer will be with us to launch the best interactive constitution on the web. And we have brought together with the co-sponsorship of our great partners at the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, the top scholars in America, to write about every clause of the Constitution, what they agree about and what they disagree about. And this will be available free online and it's launching in September. And our program will soon be uh, online and mailed uh, to all of you. It includes Senator Chris Coons on the Constitution, Chief Charles Ramsey launching an exciting new program about police legitimacy where the police from around the country will talk to school kids here at the Constitution Center about the Constitution. And on September 21st, to prepare for the Pope's visit, we will have an exciting opening of a new exhibit on religious liberty with treasures of the most significant documents of religious liberty in American history, including George Washington's first Thanksgiving proclamation and his letter to the Roman Catholics and Jews of America and uh, top scholars debating religious liberty past and present. So it's gonna be a phenomenal fall at the National Constitution Center. It's now my great honor to introduce our two uh, panelists. Uh, Jed Rakoff is a uh, judge on the US District Court for the Southern District of New York, one of the leading legal intellectuals in this country as well as one of the great contributors to debates about the kind of uh, questions involving criminal justice that we'll talk about today. He has good Philly roots. He was born here in Philadelphia and went to Swarthmore uh, and Oxford before going to Harvard Law. And he ignited a constructive national debate about plea bargaining with his path-breaking article in the November 20th, uh, 2014 issue of the New York Review of Books, Why Innocent People Plead Guilty. And his article provoked an energetic response from his co-panelist today, uh, Judge Michael M. Bailson. Uh, judge Bailson is a judge on the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. He too has Philadelphia roots, and in fact, uh, it turns out that uh, there's a family uh, connection that the judges may uh, tell us about. He went to the University of Pennsylvania for undergrad and for law school, and has served with great distinction here on the Third Circuit uh, since he was appointed in 1988. Um, gentlemen, let's get right to it. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Judge Bailson and Judge Rakoff to the National Constitution Center. Uh, Judge Rakoff, let's start at the end of your article where you actually talk about reforms for what you consider an unfair plea bargaining system. You say, if there were the political will to do so, we could eliminate mandatory minimums eliminate sentencing guidelines, and dramatically reduce the severity of our sentencing regimes in general. President Obama was here in Philadelphia yesterday at the NAACP, and I gather he made some proposals uh, that suggest that he read and agreed with your article. What exactly did the president propose, and what do you think of his proposals? So thank you, Jeff. And first of all, let me say uh, uh, how privileged I uh, feel to have been invited to this. I didn't know until you just mentioned it that uh, your organization was chartered by Congress which uh, is surprising to me because I didn't know Congress could agree on anything. <laughs> so, um, so some of you may have read in today's papers that right here in Philadelphia yesterday, uh, President Obama uh, called for the reduction or perhaps total elimination of mandatory minimum sentences 
uh, and also a general reduction in um, set sentence severities uh, across the board. Uh, and um, uh, I think that was a reflection of two things. First, uh, a recognition, I think, by many people that the mass incarceration we have in this country, uh, where 2.2 million people uh, are in jail uh, and where uh, the great majority of them are young men of color, uh, is uh, frankly uh, not only an abomination, but something uh, that has done the terrible destruction uh, to the entire uh, African American and Hispanic communities. Uh, it is a um, rate of incarceration, both in absolute and in per capita terms, that is far greater than any other country in the world. Um, crime rates have been declining in the United States for the last 24 years, and yet our incarceration rate has remained the same or even gotten higher uh, because we are locking up ever more people for ever longer periods of time. And it was really uh, thrilling to me to hear the president's proposal. Well, what I also think it represents is <coughs> there is a um, surprising, but to my mind, wonderful um, growing consensus from both the right and the left uh, that this problem has got to be dealt with uh, and that the laws that we put into place in the 70s and 80s when crime rates were rising uh, were uh, perhaps misguided or certainly <coughs> have been used in ways that uh, none of us uh, would want them to be used and that we need to do something about it. Judge Bilson, there is indeed, as Judge Rakoff suggests, this growing consensus which unites President Obama on, uh, from the Democratic side to uh, people like Rand Paul, who was here at the National Constitution Center recently and called for sentencing reform. Do you agree or disagree with the President's proposals? Well, uh, I agree with a lot of it, and, but I think this is a more complex program than just saying, a, pro, a problem than just saying that there are too many people in jail. And let me just make a couple of short points and we can develop them as time allows. First about mandatory minimums. The Judicial Conference of the United States, which speaks for all judges, uh, all federal judges, that is, on policy matters, has consistently opposed <coughs> mandatory minimums. And nonetheless, they have been enacted by Congress across a wide swath of crimes, drug crimes, firearm crimes, arson crimes. And the one factor that many people leave out is that the way a defendant who is charged with an offense that carries a mandatory minimum can avoid the mandatory minimum is by cooperating with authorities. And cooperation is a very important part of law enforcement and of making sure that all individuals who are responsible for a crime get uh, prosecuted and if they are found guilty, get imprisoned. And that has been very effective. Now that is not necessarily enough of a reason to have mandatory reason, mandatory minimums, but if we do away with them, there may be some cost in public policy of having less cooperation. Secondly, the term mass, incorpora mass incarceration has become a slogan uh, for this reform movement. And we just have to pause for a minute and remember that every individual who is in jail today is there because a judge, either a state judge in most cases or a federal judge, has imposed a sentence as they're authorized by law to do because that individual was convicted of a crime. Now, uh, I was U.S. attorney during a period of rising crime rates, uh, and one of the responses that Congress uh, enacted with support of President Clinton and very strong bipartisan support uh, by Republicans and Democrats in Congress was to uh, adopt mandatory guidelines and to adopt a number of mandatory, uh, mandatory minimums. And the crime rates have gone down. Now there's a great uh, body of literature by criminologists that debate whether crime rates have gone down because more people who were inclined to commit crimes have been in jail. I don't know the answer to that. 
but it is a question that deserves discussion in the public realm. Um, so the question is well and truly joined, uh, Judge Rakoff. You say in your article <coughs> that the rise of draconian mandatory minimums has created the virtual extinction of jury trials in federal criminal cases. In 1980, 19% <coughs> of all federal defendants went to trial. By 2010, it's less than 3%. And you said that one reason for this is that mandatory minimums allow prosecutors with weapons to bludgeon defendants into effectively coerced plea bargains. Judge Bailson worries that fewer defendants would cooperate. You suggest that this would be a good thing because this is not voluntary cooperation. Tell us more about that. Well, I mean, let's start with the statistics um, first. Uh, before mandatory minimums and uh, the sentencing guidelines, for many, many decades, between 15 and 20 percent uh, of all uh, persons who were charged uh, with a crime and whose cases were not dismissed at the outset for technical reasons or whatever, uh, went to trial. Uh, almost immediately after the mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines came into place, um, that uh, percentage dropped from 15% to 3%, and that's where it's remained to this day. Only 3% uh, of all defendants uh, f uh, feel that they can even test the system by uh, going to trial. And I think that in itself uh, uh, leads to abuses. Uh, so why has that happened? Well, typically uh, a prosecutor will say to a defendant, um, I am going to charge you or I already have charged you with the maximum that I think I can prove. And these include mandatory minimums that mean you're going to prison if I convict you for 10, 20, or more years. The judge will have nothing to say about it if you're not a cooperator. Um, but I'm willing uh, to uh, fashion a plea bargain that will reduce it to uh, five years, let's say. Um, and in fact, the overall statistics are uh, that those who go to trial uh, receive approximately three times the sentence of those who do not go to trial. Um, and so the defendant, including, in my view, a percentage uh, of totally innocent defendants, will uh, take the, if you will, the risk-adverse position and uh, enter a, uh, a guilty plea without any testing ever having been done of the government's proof. Now, uh, Judge Bailson, um, uh, uh, who in many uh, respects I've learned a lot from, and I, and I um, uh, want to make clear that we agree on as many things as we disagree on. But uh, J Judge Bailson talks about cooperators. When I was a federal prosecutor for, for seven years in the 70s, um, uh, uh, doing mostly white collar prosecutions uh, where there were no mandatory minimums, um, we had no trouble getting cooperators. Uh, I don't think there's any real evidence that mandatory minimums uh, have led to more cooperators. But even assuming arguendo, as lawyers would say, uh, that that is the uh, case, <coughs> that you're talking about a relatively small percentage of all defendants. A, a sensible prosecutor will only cut a cooperation deal with one or two people in a given case. Um, and typically, they're the first ones who come in, and they're people who are not at the very uh, top of the chain, but not at the very bottom. They need to have enough knowledge to be able to cooperate against the top people. Um, and uh, so you cut the deal with them, and they escape uh, the more uh, uh, harsh severities of mandatory minimum. But that, that would be in a typical, let's say, a narcotics case involving uh, a dozen or more defendants. That might be one or two of the people. Uh, all the others would be pleading guilty <coughs> pursuant to plea bargains um, to uh, uh, mandatory minimums that were uh, imposed regardless of what the judge might think because Congress doesn't have faith in judges in their ability to determine what the right sentence is. Um, but it would be a far less mandatory minimum than the prosecutor could charge, and that's what leads to these pleas. Uh, Judge Bilson, you have a bunch of things to say in defense of mandatory minimums, including the fact that they were adopted by Congress uh, 
and that whether judges like them is irrelevant. Congress makes the law. Many believe these laws deter crimes. You say that sentencing guidelines used to be mandatory, but now they're only advisory. They weren't adopted to bludgeon defendants, but with the careful work of Senator Kennedy and Justice Breyer. Uh, and above all, you say that you know it's wrong, as Judge Rakoff suggests, that prosecutors have the upper hand. Defendants have a strong weapon. It's called the presumption of innocence and the requirement to prove cases beyond reasonable doubt. Tell us more about why Judge Rakoff is wrong. Well, he's not entirely <laughs> wrong, but um, he <laughs> he um, he emphasizes uh, some situations that do exist in some cases. You can't talk about plea bargaining as if they are one size and one shape. There are many different types of plea bargaining as there are fish in the sea. Uh, there are some defendants, uh, actually there are many defendants, who uh, are interested in pleading guilty because they believe that they, they know that they did commit a crime. Now maybe they have been overcharged or maybe they're not as guilty as the prosecutor says, but they know that there's some risk that if they go to trial, they may be convicted of more serious crimes than they can be punished for if they plead guilty. So there is a high motivation by many defendants, this is true in both state and federal court, to plead guilty to something. And that leads to a plea bargaining discussion, dialogue between the prosecutor and the defense lawyer. Now the Supreme Court has a has never said there's anything wrong with plea bargaining. There's a recent decision where the court said that a defendant has the right to know that a plea bargain has been discussed between the defense lawyer and the prosecutor, but there's nothing inherently wrong about plea bargaining. As a matter of fact, that is the regime of uh, more than 90% of the disposition of criminal cases in the United States, as Judge Rakoff has indicated. Now, one word about the about the sentencing guidelines. Uh, 25 or more years ago, the great outcry of criminologists and legislators were that there was too much disparity in sentencing, particularly for defendants who committed similar crimes across the country and received very disparate sentences. And that's what led Justice Breyer, who was then an appellate judge, and before that was a Harvard law professor, and Senator Kennedy, and by the way, Justice Breyer had been a staff member for Senator Kennedy years before that, so they worked together uh, for a long time. And they were the prime motivators of the sentencing guidelines, and the primary purpose was to reduce or eliminate disparities in sentencing. And that was the mantra that carried the day why Congress established the guidelines and empowered a bipartisan sentencing commission to study them and to adopt them. And the Sentencing Commission's initial guidelines, which were mandatory, were based on actual sentences that had been imposed, imposed across the United States. And now that, uh, in 2005, the Supreme Court said that the mandatory nature of the guidelines was unconstitutional and gave federal judges discretion in sentencing unless there was a mandatory minimum. And cooperation has continued to a large extent. But cooperation is more significant in cases where mandatory minimums apply. Now, as I said before, that's maybe not enough of a justification. I recently had a case here, the iron workers case, where there were 12 defendants, and six of them cooperated against the leader of the union and testified. And the reason those six did so, and the prosecutor said this in open court, was because they had been charged with arson offenses, which carry a mandatory minimum. And by the way, they were all white males. So that's what I said. There are many fish in the sea, and there are many different types of criminal prosecutions. And it's hard to generalize. Uh, Judge Rakoff, we jumped right in at the end by talking about mandatory minimums and the president. But you begin this remarkable article by making a claim about history. You say that the criminal justice system in the United States today bears little relationship to what the founding fathers contemplated. You quote Thomas Jefferson, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man, by which a government can be held to the principles of the Constitution. And you say, despite the Sixth Amendment guarantee of a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury, 3% of federal cases go to jury today. And you also say that the result of this temptation to plead guilty is the conviction of the innocent. The gravest objection of all is that a significant number of defendants plead guilty to crimes they never actually committed. Tell us first, what happened historically? Why was it that 
until the Civil War, plea bargains were exceedingly rare, and now they're so common. And then uh, tell us a little bit more about the dangers of convictions of the innocent. Well, the plea bargains were uh, viewed in the 19th century by the courts, including the Supreme Court, um, as uh, in derogation of the search for truth. Uh, the thought was that uh, if someone is charged with a crime, they ought to have their day in court. The government ought to be put to its proof, and either it would establish uh, that a crime had been committed or not. Um, the reason plea bargains came into being initially uh, was the very practical one that um, beginning after the Civil War, there was an increase in crime, largely because of economic dislocations, and um, the courts were swamped with more cases than they could handle. And so the notion of plea bargains came about. In much of the world, plea bargains are still frowned upon, but uh, my own view is uh, that within limits, they uh, are a practical solution to the fact that just as, as we just can't bring every case uh, to trial. Um, but uh, it got way out of hand, is my suggestion, uh, beginning with the uh, laws in the 1970s and 80s, uh, so that instead of um, uh, 15 to 20 percent of cases going to trial, only 3 percent do. Now, the, um, the sentencing guidelines uh, are an interesting side issue, but I'll just respond quickly uh, to the, uh, uh, some of the points made by Judge Bailson. Um, it is true there was a problem of disparities um, in uh, sentencing, and that's what motivated uh, the uh, guidelines. Uh, Justice Breyer, who I believe is well on his way to changing his mind about many of these issues, if you read his dissent two weeks ago in the death penalty case where he uh, essentially says it's time for the Supreme Court to um, uh, see whether the death penalty is unconstitutional um, and gives a I think about 40 or 50 pages uh, of uh, innocent people being convicted in death penalty cases. Um, but uh, Justice Breyer and others believe that um, a number system, in effect, uh, an arithmetic system, would uh, do away with um, uh, the disparity. Um, I think uh, it was a good idea in theory. It has proven to be a bad idea in practice for several reasons. Uh, first, Congress has repeatedly told the Sentencing Commission to up the ante. Judge Bailson points out that originally the Sentencing Commission took the mean of all sentences throughout uh, the United States. The present guidelines bear no relation to that. Uh, uh, Professor Kate Stiff at Yale has done a study, for example, in the white collar area, the sentences are now uh, under the guidelines, 500% higher than they were when the guidelines were initially um, uh, put in place. And of course, mandatory minimums trump the guidelines in any event, and they're particularly uh, potent in narcotics cases, which is a big part of the federal criminal docket. Secondly, the biggest motivating force, so far as at least liberals were concerned, like Senator Kennedy, in favor of the guidelines, was the thought that there were racial disparities in sentencing. But the guidelines, ironically, imposed a much greater racial disparity that we only did away with a very few years ago. The guidelines said that uh, uh, every ounce of crack cocaine would be treated for guideline purposes as the equivalent of 100, crack, 100 ounces of powder cocaine. Uh, overwhelmingly, those who are convicted in crack cocaine uh, cases are African American. Uh, the great majority of those who are convicted in powder cocaine uh, cases are either white or Hispanic. Uh, the result was an unbelievable disparity, racial disparity, between sentences in crack cocaine and powder cocaine uh, cases that was far, far greater than any perceived racial disparity that had uh, existed before the guidelines. Uh, and uh, 
finally, I think the guidelines obscure the fact that there are still huge disparities. But they are no longer disparities between judges, they are disparities between prosecutors. Because with 97% of all cases being negotiated as plea bargains, it's really those plea bargains that set the sentencing range for all practical purposes. Some prosecutors are more sympathetic to defendants than others. There's a great disparity uh, among prosecutors and even more so among uh, U.S. Attorney, attorney's offices in different districts as to what's the appropriate plea bargain in a particular case. That is not exposed to any judicial scrutiny whatsoever. It's all done behind closed doors and then presented as a package to the judge. Um, so uh, I think all the things that the guidelines were supposed to cure have not been cured and we have created instead worse, a worse situation with the guidelines. Having said that, they pale in um, comparison with the evils of the um, uh, mandatory minimums, which essentially takes sentencing out of the hands of judges altogether. That's the re re real effect of them. Lots of powerful points to respond to, including the idea that these guidelines intended to reduce disparities, including racial disparities, have exacerbated them and they have uh, put tremendous discretion in the hands of prosecutors, some of whom have a policy of encouraging cooperation and downward departures, as you say that you did as a U.S. attorney, where you resulted in a third of all sentences imposed in the district having downward departures, but others don't. Uh, so Judge Rakoff is, is absolutely correct uh, about uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> about the uh, background of the guidelines and about the, uh, the congressional insistence that judges impose tougher sentences for crack uh, than for ordinary cocaine. Uh, and uh, this existed for a number of years. It was recently uh, lessened by a, another act of Congress called the Fair Sentencing Act, and we are now allowed to reduce retroactively sentences that were imposed uh, for crack for many crack defendants, not all of them, but for most of them. But the, uh, but the fundamental uh, problem that uh, exists, in my view, is that there are still uh, uh, mandatory minimums uh, that result in a lot of sentences. Now, one of the important points that Judge Rakoff meant uh, that, that but is stated in his original article was that innocent people were being convicted, were, were motivated to plead guilty. Now, I think one of the fundamental jobs of a judge, whether in state court and federal court, and that over 90% of the crimes, of the prosecutions of crimes in this country are done in state courts. Federal courts are uh, like the tip of the iceberg. But we set an example uh, in a lot of ways, and we have a lot of the bigger cases so that there's a lot of impact from what federal judges do. One of the great advances in the last 10, 15 years or so have been the discovery through, largely through DNA and other ways, uh, that many people, and more than one is, is too many, uh, innocent people have been convicted of crimes. And uh, I'm close to a lot of the people in Pennsylvania who are involved in finding and remedying the conviction of the innocent. And we, uh, some of them are in the audience, including the executive director. And uh, they have done a tremendous job of uncovering uh, wrongful convictions. And when I say innocent, I mean actually innocent. That is, the person uh, did not commit any crime whatsoever, but was nonetheless convicted. Sometimes innocence is used, well, you know, I was convicted of first degree, but I was only guilty of second degree. That's not, to me, actual innocence. But uh, one of the problems, in my view, is that uh, judges are not being tough enough in assuring when they take a guilty plea that there is a factual basis for the plea. <coughs> Rule 11 of the federal rules require that the judge do that. Uh, and I try and live up to it, and I'm sure Judge Rakoff, and I'm sure most federal judges try. But occasionally, and, but occasionally is, is, is still too many, <coughs> guilty people are motivated, not guilty, innocent people are motivated 
to plead guilty for the wrong reason, because they're afraid of getting convicted, even though they did not commit any crime whatsoever. And that is a defect in our system that requires remedy. Okay, Judge Rakoff, let's so, talk about so the I, exoneration I of the innocent. Bonkers. Here yes. we are in total agreement. Yeah. Um, but just to put some more flesh on that bone, um, the National Registry of Exonerations, um, this is a um, uh, group at the University of Michigan that keeps tabs on all actually innocent cases, uh, uh, the, the type that uh, Judge Bailson was just describing, as opposed to people who said, I've been convicted of something worse than I thought I did, but I did do a crime. But th these are people who were totally innocent, were nevertheless uh, uh, either uh, went to trial or were found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and their uh, uh, initial direct appeals uh, were denied, uh, or uh, according to the National uh, Registry of uh, 1,535 persons who have been uh, actually exonerated uh, since 1984, 221 of them, or about 14%, pled guilty. So you may ask yourself, well, how could someone be pleading guilty if they were actually innocent? Uh, and what I try to suggest is some of the reasons, some of the pressures, uh, there are also uh, situations involving false confessions. There are also situations involving uh, persons who are either mentally retarded or uh, at least uh, uh, mentally, intellectually uh, challenged, um, and um, also young people who were uh, easily uh, pressured. Um, uh, but uh, it is a significant number of people, and those are just from the uh, cases where there's been proof of actual innocence. Uh, after the fact. I totally agree with Judge Bailson that um, judges should do more about uh, inquiring at the time of guilty plea as to what the underlying evidence is. But consider some of the difficulties. Uh, once a plea bargain is arrived at, the adversary system basically breaks down. Uh, the prosecutor is going to get up and say, Judge, our proof would show such and such. The defense counsel, having already cut the deal, is not going to challenge that in any respect. So yes, judges should do much more in asking their own questions and, and really trying to get uh, uh, more deep information about what the underlying evidence is. But it's not an easy thing when both sides are saying, judge, uh, we both agree. This is it. Here's, here's what the facts are. And uh, furthermore, um, we're increasingly learning that a lot of evidence that we once thought was really good evidence um, is not so good. I have the, the privilege of serving on uh, the National Commission on Forensic Science, and that commission was set up by the Department of Justice at the behest of Congress because of increasing evidence, much of which I'm sure you've all read about, uh, where forensic science labs faked evidence, where forensic science was portrayed as being much stronger than it really is, uh, things like that. So when the prosecutor gets up and says, judge, we've got fingerprints or we've got um, uh, uh, other forensic evidence, uh, you know, it, is a judge going to at that point say, well, I want to uh, bring in the fingerprint examiner and go through um, what in federal court is called a, a Daubert hearing to determine how reliable it is, very unlikely. Um, another problem is eyewitness identification. Um, the, um, of, of the cases where there was exoneration that I referred to uh, previously, uh, uh, at least one third uh, were the result of inaccurate eyewitness identification. These were not witnesses who lied. These were witnesses uh, who, for a variety of reasons, simply uh, made a misidentification. Um, but when a prosecutor gets up at a guilty plea and says, judge, we have an eyewitness to this crime, and in state crime, that's often the situation, um, uh, is, the, is the judge going to say, well, I want to have that witness come in, and I want to test out just how strong that uh, eyewitness identification was. As a practical matter, that's not going to happen. So I think, as Judge Bailson has correctly said in, in other respects, it's a very complicated problem. 
Judge Bielson, uh, Judge Rakoff has a specific proposal for involving judges in the plea bargaining process. He advocates what a few jurisdictions, Connecticut and Florida, have begun experimenting with, which is having judges uh, review the case before the plea is entered. He suggests that a magistrate would take witnesses in a closed hearing. No plea could be entered until the magistrate makes a recommendation, either to dismiss the case, to proceed to trial, or to enter into a plea bargain. And no party would be required to follow the magistrate's suggestions. What do you think of that idea? Well, you finally hit upon something on which we really do disagree. Okay. Good. That's uh, my job. I, you know, I think taking the responsibility out of the hand, out of the job of the sentencing judge would be a great mistake. In the first place, we we have devoted a lot of resources to the prosecution of an imprisonment of the people convicted of crimes, and many people say it's too much. Judge Rakoff's proposal would only add to the expense and burden, and it would relieve the sentencing judge of the responsibility that he or she now has to make the inquiry to determine whether, uh, if it's a case of identification, whether there is corroborating evidence, how sure the witness is, what the plea bargain is, if there is a sentence. And it would also require a total change in, in federal law at least, because under federal law, judges are not allowed to participate in the plea bargaining process. And that has, in my view, is a very important and a very sound reason, because the, judge, the sentencing judge retains independence over the inquiry, over the uh, sentence to be imposed. Now, many states allow judges to uh, negotiate with the defense counsel and the prosecutor, and sometimes the defendant himself or herself. And I think that is a great mistake because it tends to sweep the judge into uh, this whole uh, concept of negotiating whether somebody should go to jail and if so, for how long and whether they're cooperating and what they know and what they didn't know. And that's really not a judicial function. So I think the answer to the uh, problem of making sure we do not send people to jail who are truly innocent is to make the judge the responsible party and not to have another superstructure or bureaucracy or magistrate judges who are already very busy doing a lot of other things. Judge Rakoff's proposal became a reality. We need double the number of magistrates we have, at least in federal court in my view, uh, and, and it costs billions of dollars. And we're already spending, everybody says, too much money on this issue already. Judge Rakoff, why is your expensive and misguided proposal not a great mistake? <laughs> so. First, I want to make clear that I was driven to this proposal as a secondary proposal. My primary uh, belief, which I am more optimistic about now than I was a year ago when I wrote that article, is to do away with mandatory minimums, greatly reduce the uh, severity of the sentencing guidelines and things of that sort. Uh, this was a fallback proposal if that doesn't occur. Um, but. Uh, it would not be the same judge who is handling the case. It would be a magistrate judge, and he would not tell the sentencing judge what was going on. What the magistrate judge could do at an early stage of a case, in my view, is make the kind of inquiries I was talking about before. He could find out whether that eyewitness was really any good. He could find out whether that forensic evidence uh, really stood up to scientific principles and so forth. He could make the kind of detailed inquiries early on in the case without prejudice to either party's position, that I think would uh, tend to ferret out uh, cases where the person uh, may well be innocent uh, and being wrongly accused. Um, there are downsides. I think the biggest downside is the one Judge Bailson just referred to, um, is it might uh, be quite costly. Uh, I'm not sure it would cost quite as much as as he believes, but it, it certainly would involve some additional expense. Consider, though, the huge expense that we now undergo when we put people in prison. It costs, if, if I remember correctly, the last study I saw, it costs something like $60,000 uh, to keep a person in prison for a year, uh, either in state or federal prison. Um, so uh, a magistrate judge uh, makes about $100,000 or so. Um, you can get um, 
two-thirds of a magistrate judge, so to speak, uh, if you just eliminated one person from prison. Now, I'm, I'm overstating that, that whole, uh, the arithmetic of all that, but my point is that I think there would be a uh, less obvious but offsetting savings if a lot of people who are now being sent to prison were not sent to prison. Uh, I also think, aside from protecting the innocent, that uh, the kinds of questions that a good magistrate judge would put to the prosecutor uh, at the early stage of a case before the prosecutor really got locked in his uh, position would lead to many more cases where the prosecutor agreed to uh, deferred prosecutions, to sending persons off to um, rehabilitation programs and things of that sort. Judge Bailson, he didn't mention this, but he has been a major mover in some wonderful rehabilitation efforts that have been made here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I think uh, uh, with the help of uh, earlier inquiries by magistrate judges, even greater use could be made of those uh, uh, wonderful programs. Uh, Judge Bailson, are you, uh, do you accept any part of uh, Judge Rakoff's suggestion that the uh, conviction of the innocent reflects the coercive pressures of plea bargaining? Well, I think there, there, there certainly can be some truth for that in some cases. Um, as Judge Rakoff indicated, uh, the great majority of exonerations have taken place in cases where the defendant pled not guilty. Uh, and there was some pseudo-scientific evidence that was introduced or faulty eyewitness testimony uh, that is a result of which a, a jury convicted an innocent person. Uh, I think all of us are going to be hard pressed to say that we can prevent that from happening uh, in what our job is it is first to recognize that that is a totally unacceptable uh, situation, that an innocent person is convicted, and that we have resources and mechanisms to uh, work for exonerations uh, when they are merited. And these newly developing innocent projects, of which there are many across the United States, uh, have been doing that uh, with, with remarkable success, and they need to be encouraged. The problem we're talking about here is where people plead guilty even though they are totally innocent. And that is a, a, a problem, but in my mind, it's a relatively small problem because uh, most people, the great majority of people who plead guilty, have committed some crime. And you can argue till uh, dawn, from dawn to dawn whether they were convict, over-convicted or over-sentenced or they got off leniently and there are ten sides to every story. But the issue is whether someone who is truly innocent is, feels coerced to plead guilty. And on that, I still say the best way to avoid that is to make the sentencing judge the person responsible for making sure that there is a factual basis for the plea, which is a core requirement of Rule 11 of the federal rules. And every state should be required to have a similar rule and to enforce it and abide by it. Judge Rickoff, do you disagree that it's just a small number of guilty pleas that result from the pressures of plea bargaining? And you also uh, tell us about the Aaron Swartz case. Aaron Swartz's father wrote a response to your article that was quite supportive of your conclusions, and it had a rather tragic end. Tell us what happened there. So um, the uh, criminologists have tried to figure out uh, what percentage of uh, innocent people plead guilty. And I uh, think uh, the fair thing to say is they've had difficulty doing so. It's not easy uh, to uh, ferret that out. Um, uh, and when you talk about cases of uh, exoneration like the Innocent Project and like the National Registry, the percent of people who pled guilty who were actually innocent is always between 10 and 15 percent, but that's not a fair sample. Uh, we want to look at the, the great uh, um, mass of people uh, who pled guilty, and, it, and the percentages are probably lower. The criminologist studies, which again, I don't particularly uh, place great weight on because I think it's uh, not an easy thing to measure, uh, have put the figure at between uh, 2 percent and 8 percent. Um, if 
being, in my view, quite conservative, we were to uh, believe it was as low as 1%, then we are talking about 20,000 people who are right now in prison who are actually innocent but pled guilty. So that's a pretty substantial number no matter uh, how you look at it. Um, the uh, Aaron Schwartz case, which uh, uh, is just one of many uh, that I could recount, uh, was a, a, a young student at MIT who was accused of um, uh, taking um, uh, data from the database of uh, another university uh, illegally. Uh, and the prosecutor saw this as a um, case in which he wanted to set uh, an example and kept uh, raising the ante of what he would demand uh, if the case either went to trial or even if there was a, a guilty plea. Uh, he was up to uh, 50 years and more um, when Aaron Schwartz committed suicide. Um, the, uh, I had a client uh, in when I, I was a criminal defense lawyer after I was a prosecutor, uh, I had a client accused of murder uh, who, in my view, was uh, actually innocent. Uh, I never got to test that because um, uh, he committed suicide, and I cannot say as a, I don't have any psychological uh, training, uh, but certainly the fact that the uh, prosecutor in that case was seeking the death penalty uh, was, in my view, a factor in uh, uh, what led to his death. Um, there's a very interesting article which I commend to you all that a came out about two weeks ago in the Georgetown Law Journal. Uh, and it's written by uh, what you might consider an unlikely source, uh, uh, Judge Alex Kaczynski. Judge Kaczynski is a well-known conservative judge on the Ninth Circuit. For those of you who are not lawyers, the Ninth Circuit is California, Hawaii, Alaska, and all those other beautiful places. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Judge Kaczynski is certainly uh, not a judge who's known as a bleeding heart. Uh, but in this article, he endorses pretty much uh, everything that I've said in my article. And here, he, and, and just to give one example, he talks about false confessions, which are another situation that often lead people to plead guilty, though they're actually innocent because the prosecutor's got a confession from them, and so the chance of of winning a trial is very reduced. And he says, uh, uh, one of the myths are that confessions are infallible because innocent people never confess. We know now that this is not true. Innocent people do confess with surprising regularity. Harsh interrogation tactics, a variant of the Stockholm Syndrome, the desire to end the ordeal, emotional and financial exhaustion, family considerations, and the youth or feeble-mindedness of the suspect can re result in remarkably detailed confessions that are later shown to be utterly false. And I agree with Judge Kaczynski. Remarkable. Uh, uh, we have some phenomenal questions from the audience. As always, uh, you've just answered, uh, Judge Raycock, the question about the statistics on the number of people who are innocent, and you say that even if it's 1%, which you think is a low estimate, that would still be a whole lot of people. One of our great audience members asks, do innocent people plead guilty because they're held in jail for years pre-trial and see no way of returning to their homes with a guilty plea? This motivation has nothing to do with likely verdict or sentence. Judge well, uh, there are, there can be a number of reasons why uh, people who are completely innocent plead guilty and it's an abhorrent result. And one problem uh, is that sometimes prosecutors are not ethical and that is an issue. Uh, if you live in a state where you elect prosecutors, uh, that should be an issue as to what kind of ethical regime uh, the head prosecutor, the, usually the district attorney or the attorney general, uh, demand of their staff and what kind of investigation they do of a crime to make sure that an innocent person is not pleading guilty. 
And the same thing applies to U.S. attorney's offices. And as Judge Rakoff said earlier, uh, there are uh, 93 separate districts in the United States. Each one has their own U.S. attorney. Uh, they, in theory, they report to the attorney general in Washington, but realistically, they're uh, very independent and they follow different practices. And there are over a thousand district judges like ourselves, and they vary greatly, as you might. Uh, some get out on the bed on the left side, and some on the right side, and some care very deeply about. Uh, defendants who are about to be sentenced and others really don't pay that much attention and that's uh, just a fact of life. But we have to have procedures and a regimen and an ethical standard that the conviction of one innocent person is wrong. It's just wrong and it doesn't matter whether it's one person or one percent, uh, it's wrong. And our system won't be perfect and will until we remove that. That doesn't mean that for all the serious crimes that are committed in this country and for all the danger that lurks by people who are out there uh, wanting to rob and to commit extortions or to rob banks or to embezzle or be corrupt, that we should up in a system that works relatively well for them. We have to prosecute those people because they are criminals and many of them belong in jail because they are threat to public safety or they're recidivists. But at the same time, we've got to be on guard that we don't convict anybody who is innocent. And I think we can do both. So uh, on the uh, adding to, to what Judge Bailson said, but on the specific question of detention for years, um, that's relatively rare in the federal system, but is quite common in uh, many state systems um, in New York. Um, that you may have read about all the problems they've been having in Rikers Island. Um, the conditions there are terrible and people have been held there for three, four, five years before they even get to trial or get to enter a guilty plea. And whether that can be a factor in course in guilty pleas, I don't know for a fact, but I, one common sense would suggest uh, that it, it might well be uh, uh, a factor. There are important studies that show that um, the, when you're dealing with relatively young people, um, even being confined for a few days, particularly in solitary, which is uh, a very uh, terrible place to be, uh, can have a dramatic uh, uh, effect on their sense of, of their self-worth, and they'll do almost anything to get out of that uh, situation. Um, uh, I also agree there's tremendous variation here between uh, U.S. attorneys, between states, and even between judges, although my own belief is that all judges raised uh, in Philadelphia are the creme de la creme. So. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. T tell, t tell the story. Was your dad taught uh, Judge Bailson's uh, father? What's the connection? Yes, well, um, Judge Rakoff's father was uh, one of the leading uh, originators of the medical uh, field called reproductive endocrinology, commonly referred to as infertility practice. And my wife, would, when she was a, a medical student and as an intern at Pennsylvania Hospital, uh, worked under him and uh, had the great has great regard for his uh, ability. And I'm very proud of her as a result of his uh, tutelage. So I, I would say that uh, Judge Bales and I are sure agree. Really smart people become doctors than the rest of us. <laughs> that, was, that was my Jewish mother's complaint as well. <laughs> Absolutely. We have uh, several questions about the role of the defense counsel, and here is uh, one of them. Judge Rakoff speaks in his article about how defense counsel is at a disadvantage from the outset with less information at their disposal and limited time with their clients. Are there changes in the system that can be made to alleviate this disadvantage and perhaps reduce the necessity of plea bar bargains for these reasons? Well, let me, we haven't mentioned today what we refer to as the Brady Rule. The Brady Rule refers to a U.S. Supreme Court case that obligates prosecutors to disclose exculpatory evidence. If that rule is followed, as it should be in every case, that would dramatically, in my view, reduce the incidence of the truly innocent uh, people being convicted or being allowed to plead guilty. But it's not followed universally as it should be. 
Would you like to? No, I totally agree with that. Um, the, um, and, and, and many judges in many opinions have spoken out about that, and you will see uh, in cases of exoneration uh, frequently reference uh, to uh, uh, people who um, either confessed uh, to the crime themselves, but the police discounted the confession, or um, the uh, uh, eyewitnesses who said it was someone else, uh, and that wasn't brought to light. Um, it is compounded, though, by the fact that <coughs> prosecutors, for I think wholly legitimate reasons, namely saving resources, uh, will give the best plea deal to the person who agrees to plea guilty earliest. Um, so uh, if you're a defense counsel, uh, when you get into a case the pro and you go to talk to the prosecutor, uh, the prosecutor will typically say, uh, look, if you're willing to uh, plead guilty, and I think your guy is totally guilty, um, if you're willing to plead guilty in the next two, three weeks, uh, I'll give you deal X, um, and the implied message, which is usually carried out, is if you wait, um, you will not get the same deal. And, and, and it applies also to the cooperators that were uh, mentioned before. It's the potential cooperator who comes in first who gets the better deal. Now, one unfortunate side effect of that is that much of the Brady material that would have been discovered if the defense attorney had put the prosecutor to the test, I'm not talking in trial, I'm just talking about in the offices saying, you know, I've been doing my own investigation and I hear there's this other person out there who might well be the culprit, what about that? That doesn't happen because the deal is set early on and so the prosecutor himself may not even be aware of some of that Brady material. Um, so. There is a problem here. I don't have a quick solution to this particular part of the problem, um, but the, the perfectly legitimate uh, desire of the prosecutor to wrap things up early because of the huge demands on their resources can sometimes lead to Brady material not emerging at all. This is what was going on with Greece in the last month. Uh, they were negotiating a, a plea deal and that what the terms were going to be for Greece to be sentenced uh, and we all see what the result is. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that seems such an apt analogy. <laughs> Defendants do not have the option of a Grexit, however. You're right. Um, I think it's time, gentlemen, for closing arguments. Uh, Judge Bailson, you've provoked an extremely salutary national debate with this important article. Uh, it's striking uh, that Judge Kaczynski has, uh, from the other side of the aisle, has, has endorsed your conclusions. Tell us, why did you decide to write this? Why did you go out on a limb? Why do you think it's important? And why is it important that the reforms you advocate be accepted? No, he's addressing you, right? Yes, and then he can respond and tell you why you're wrong. I'm sorry, you want me to go yes, first? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Well, I was led to write this article by, for uh, basically three reasons. First, um, the Federal Judicial Code of Conduct uh, affirmatively encourages judges to speak out on issues involving the administration of criminal justice. Uh, in other areas, uh, judges are not um, uh, told to do that, but uh, the code uh, affirmatively uh, imposes that. Uh, it's not an absolute obligation, but it's a strong encouragement. In the 20 years that I've been on the bench, I became ever more aware of how little I knew about the persons I was sentencing, about the cases in which they had pled guilty. Um, the, uh, I may have failed to meet uh, uh, Judge Bailson's um, um, uh, proper suggestion that uh, judges inquire at length uh, before accepting a guilty plea. Uh, but these cases would come back to me. They would come back to me in habeas petitions. They would come back to me when someone was uh, got out of prison uh, and uh, would um, uh, be arrested on a violation of probation or the like. Uh, 
They would come back to me in letters that I received sometimes years later uh, from uh, the defendant himself. Um, and I began to mistrust uh, how the system that I was a part of uh, was operating. Um, and it was really more that personal um, bewilderment that led me to write the article more than anything else. Uh, and uh, Judge Bilson, having heard uh, this uh, colloquy, uh, what, what are your final thoughts? Well, my final thoughts are that uh, Judge Rakoff has uh, illuminated uh, what is a, a problem in some cases. The problem I had with his article was I thought it painted too broad a brush. It ignored the differences between federal rules and what goes on in a lot of states. It, and it didn't pay enough attention of a responsibility that every judge has to make sure that uh, an innocent person does not uh, go, get sent to jail. But that it uh, did, and, and it just really made it sound like plea bargaining as a, a concept was wrong and that we should do something else. And I think that what we need to do is to insist on high ethical behavior, insist on adherence to the Brady rule, and insist on judges taking responsibility that the rules are adhered to. And that uh, we're, I'm not sure we're ever gonna solve this problem 100%, but if we're on the, the lookout for it, uh, I think that our justice system is still the best one in the world. Judge Rakoff, in fact, the New York Review gives the last word to the author, so you get one final <laughs> rejoinder. I think judges have a built-in bias towards uh, believing that their system is basically working well. Um, many years ago, Learned Hand, who was obviously a, a, one of the greatest judges in the history of the United States, in one of his opinions said um, that uh, the notion uh, that, that our procedure has always been haunted by the ghost of the innocent person convicted, it is uh, a, a, a total um, fallacy. Uh, we know now that that is not true. But why did such a distinguished judge as Learned Hand believe it? I think in part it's because when you're part of the system, when you're trying your best to make sure that justice is done, and I think um, that is true of the overwhelming majority of state and federal judges in this country, it's very hard to accept that maybe what's coming out of that system may not be nearly as good as you think it is. And so it's hard, I think, for judges to be objective. For better or worse, I've come around to the view that the system is much more fallible than I think uh, Judge Bailson believes. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Judge Bailson and Judge Rakoff.